Hi, my name is Michael Weinstein, and I'm a scientist on the bioinformatics and microbiomics teams at Zymo Research. I'm here today to talk about the OTU and ASV analysis methods for targeted microbiome sequencing and what their key differences are. In targeted sequencing, we are taking one specific gene that should be present in all species relevant to the question. This could be a gene that can be found across an entire kingdom, such as all bacteria, or something that is common to just the members of my group of interest, such as Staphylococcus. The gene needs to have some properties that make it favorable to this kind of use. Looking here, we see the level of conservation of a region on the y-axis, and the x-axis is just going along the length of the gene. Specifically, we need regions of high conservation that we can use for priming, surrounding regions of low conservation or high variability that we can use to distinguish between different taxa. We can do this by priming in the conserved regions and amplifying the variable regions by PCR for sequencing analysis. And for even higher resolution, if the gene structure is favorable, we can prime to more distant conserved regions to capture multiple variable regions in the same amplicon. This not only gives us the benefits of additional sequence, but also two separate variable regions tied together in a single sequencing read. An ideal gene for targeted sequencing should, first and foremost, be easily sequenceable, with no extreme GC content regions or secondary structures that make amplification and sequencing difficult. It should be present in our group of interest, and even potentially beyond. It should be reasonably well characterized and understood in terms of how quickly it changes over evolutionary history, and it should have a large existing database of reference sequences available so that we don't have to build one ourselves. While this describes a few genes, by far the most commonly used is from the ribosome, and specifically the smaller ribosomal subunit, which is the 16S in bacteria and the 18S in eukaryotes and archaea. There are a few challenges that come with this identification method. Here we focus on the fact that sequencing is imperfect, and that Illumina and other platforms make some base call errors, with their rate and nature being dependent on the specific platform and read length being done. Most importantly, we do not want to identify new species or determine our sample's diversity based upon sequencing errors. You will hear me refer to sequences or anything else generated by our techniques that is not actually from our sample, often as artifact. An analogy for this problem starts off with this very sharp, detailed photo of my dog and assistant debugger for the Figaro program, Andrew. For those of you seeing this with lower resolution, I'm going to provide a zoom of his nose and tongue to better see detail. This is what sequencing errors do to our image of a sample. They create some amount of noise or artifact that can obscure or distract from the true image. And one of the simplest methods to minimize the effect of this noise is to blur our image a bit, which costs us some detail, but makes the main features more clear, and helps us see our image through the noise, even if we lose some detail. Applying this to metagenomic sequencing data, when we get back our targeted sequencing, it is a random collection of amplicon reads from our sample, assuming we did things right. Now we have to organize, group, and classify things. And a quick note here, for the purpose of simplicity, I'm going to treat sequence variants and species as a one-to-one -one map. Reality is, of course, much more complex, and one species can actually have multiple copies of the same target gene, meaning that it can generate multiple sequences. Also, two similar species can share an identical sequence, especially if sequencing is limited to shorter, single variable regions of the target gene. And as I mentioned before, a key reason for the OTU and ASV methods, sequencing is far from error free. So the simplest method to understand, as I mentioned before, is blurring, or in this case, clustering. Taxa are grouped based upon similarity of the target gene sequence. 97% is a pretty common threshold value out there, but your mileage may vary. And if this process is carried out without any respect to a database of reference sequences for the target gene, it is called de novo clustering, the most computationally expensive form of clustering there is. And when new samples are added or when multiple studies must be compared, the clustering operation for the whole study must be repeated with equal and often greater computational expense. And of course, clustering can change with new data, with sequences clustering together that might not have before or sequences being separated that may have previously been together. Of course, reference databases are now pretty extensive, and it would be a shame not to use them, especially if they were built using our sample type. So in a process called open reference clustering, we can quickly cluster sequences that are similar to what we find in our database around those reference sequences, and then carry out something like de novo clustering on sequences that don't quite fit. And of course, if there is open reference clustering, there must be closed reference clustering. 
where we simply require that all sequences be clustered around reference sequences from the database, dropping out those that don't fit. This process can work for thoroughly studied sample types like human stool, but poorly studied sample types, you might find that much of what's interesting in your sample gets dropped because it has yet to be studied and you only see things from your sample that are close to what has been well studied. This is an example of reference bias. So with our OTU approach, we know some of these sequences arose from errors and we will essentially blur out these errors by combining sequences that are extremely similar and treating them as a unit represented by a consensus sequence. These clustered units are very fast to create if they are being created entirely around a reference database using closed reference clustering, but they may be subject to reference bias or only being able to see what others have seen before. They may be generated de novo or reference free, but this is computationally expensive and clustering patterns can change with the addition or removal of samples from the study. They can also be created using open reference clustering, which is similar to combining the two previous methods and has properties somewhere between them. But what if we considered the frequency with which we observe each exact sequence and the differences between the exact sequences, and with some computational effort, built an error model for our sequencing run so we might know which sequences can be expected due to errors and about what frequencies. We could determine our confidence in a sequence not being artifact and drop sequences that are likely to be from error or otherwise artifact, while retaining sequences where we can be highly confident that they did not arise from some kind of sequencing error or other artifact. Side note, these numbers are made up examples. I did no actual calculations to arrive at them here. Our outcome looks and sounds a lot like what we get from clustering. So what changed? Within that Diplococcus looking cluster from before, I showed how we might identify that two sequences were easily explained by errors, so we can drop them here. And now that OTU is not a consensus sequence anymore, it is an exact sequence, or an Amplicon sequence variant, an ASV, describing a single exact sequence. If we apply this type of approach to removing sequences likely to be error from the rest of our sample, as I will do here behind the scenes through the magic of PowerPoint, we are now left with only exact sequences of high confidence. And instead of a table describing sequence clusters, I have a table describing exact sequences observed in my sample. Because my table describes exact sequences observed in my sample with high statistical confidence that they are not some form of artifact, if I add a sample to my study later or want to compare it to someone else's sample, sequences that were not detected in the new sample should not change sequences that were detected in the original sample, and a new ASV showing up with confidence in the new sample should not change my conclusions or need to be grouped somehow with sequences I detected in my original sample. One other thing that can change, and if you were looking carefully at the last set of slides, you already might have noticed this. If the number of times I observe an exact sequence goes way up, I can become much more confident in that sequence not being artifact, and potentially even gain enough confidence to say that it is likely a real exact sequence from my sample that represents diversity within that single OTU, which was treated as a single unit, and would have caused me to lose some of the diversity that existed in my sample. So going back to my earlier analogy, the ASV approach asks if we could be confident in what is noise here and what is an element from the true image, if we can find a pattern for those things that we are confident in, we can attempt to restore our view of our true image while retaining many of the details that would have been lost by blurring away the noise. The Amplicon sequence variant approach asks, what is the statistical support or confidence in each unique sequence not being due to sequencing error or otherwise artifact? The costs of this approach are that it can be sometimes more computationally intensive than some methods of clustering. And we may throw out some sequences that were real but such low abundance that we could not reach our confidence threshold with them. We don't get back representative consensus sequences. Instead, we get exact sequences that we can statistically support as being present in the sample. We gain potentially higher resolution and don't risk combining multiple real sequences that existed in our sample into a single abstraction. We do not use a reference at any point until assigning taxonomy, so we are identifying sequences in a manner free of reference bias. This method is sometimes called exact sequence variant or zero radius OTU. Comparing some key points of these two methods, OTUs can be subject to reference bias if reference sequences were used in their generation. Reference sequence is not used in generating ASV sequences, making them reference bias free. 
OTU tables cannot be combined between studies when they are generated reference free, but ASVs being exact sequences instead of an abstract cluster with a consensus sequence should not change with the addition of new data. An OTU can potentially contain multiple similar species. An ASV, however, should only represent a single species, and if it represents multiple species, it is because they share the same sequence and are indistinguishable by this target region. This is very unlikely to happen if longer regions are used, or if multiple regions are covered. Both methods are subject to chimeras, a specific type of sequencing artifact that often plagues targeted sequencing studies. But because of the nature of OTUs as abstract consensus sequences, chimera detection can be a bit more difficult and potentially require a reference, thus introducing reference bias, while ASV chimera detection is much simpler and reference-free. And of course, when writing or making slides, ASV is not a victim of autocorrect nearly as often as OTU. Thank you for your time and attention. I will see you for our next video.